Ritual, verses 16 to 17. Back in verse 8, Paul's first major warning to these Colossian believers, threatened by false teachers, was this. The warning was this. Do not let anyone take you captive. That was the first big warning in verse 8. Now comes the second one in verse 16. Do not let anyone judge you. How about that? First of all, don't let anyone take you captive to all these daft ideas. Secondly, don't let anyone judge you. Now, right at the very beginning, let me point out here, he's not saying don't judge anyone. There's loads of that all across Scripture. The Lord Jesus teaches not to judge anyone else's servant, right? Scripture says, judge not that ye be not judged. This is not that. This is something else. This is, do not let anyone judge you. See, it's the other direction. Mm -hmm. Have you seen that? Because that's fundamental. That is absolutely crucial. Do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink with regard to a religious festival. New moon, Sabbath, Sabbath, uh, new moon celebration on a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that will come. The reality is found in Christ. Do not have any truck with those people who judge you by Shadowlands values. Don't let them judge you. <laughs> That's sticking your neck out, isn't it? Oh, excuse me. Don't you dare judge me. That ain't gonna last. That's gonna be a smoke pile. Forget that. Here's the second major warning. It is crucially important, not just that you do not judge, but that you do not let others who call themselves brother to you judge you on the basis of things like this, because of what it perpetrates in the Church of God. You have a duty and a responsibility to those who judge you and will seek to judge you in this way. Is that fascinating? I could stop now and have a cup of coffee, because that is just an amazing thing. Well, because of all the things Paul has been saying in the preceding verses, about the effectiveness of Christ's cross, to pay the price of the Christian's sin, and to set me free from sin and death and hell, and drag me back from the verge of bondage to the fear of death again, he says, on the basis of those things, because of the cross, because you're a saved sinner, because, you could use Romans, couldn't you? Because there is now, therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, but then judge you, because that would be to unproclaim the gospel. Mm -hmm. Is that, is that added up? That makes sense. If the hosts of hell can get you or others to doubt that what Christ has done on the cross is enough to pay the price of sin, to set you free from death and hell, then those same forces of darkness have done their work. Because salvation is by grace through faith alone in Him and what He's done. And if you doubt it, it's undone. In that sense. Doubt undoes me. Do not let anyone judge you go to the heart of preventing the biggest objective of the hosts of hell against the individual believer. Not letting them judge you on things that don't matter preserves the effectiveness of cross, cross, death on our behalf, salvation by grace through faith alone. That's how important it is. Don't take it on the chin, he says. Don't walk away. Don't just shrug it off. No, we don't do that. Because this goes to the heart of the effectiveness of Christ's death, the price he's already paid, the areas in which that is effectively done have been spelled out already in the preceding verses. Don't let him do it. How do we have to work that out? What areas do we have to work out that truth of Christ's sufficiency of Christ's death on the cross by grace through faith alone for me? Well, we work it out in these areas. Ritual, religion, and rules. So those things, ritual, religion, and rules, they are the instruments of the hosts of hell to undo the salvation of those who appear otherwise to profess faith and be saved. Whose work is ritual, religion, and what was it? Rules doing? Causing condemnation of those who are already saved. It's doing the devil's work, isn't it? Who would believe that? Is that surprising? <laughs> is a testimony to the extent to which Wales has been rendered devoid of a good, faithful, thoughtful Bible teaching ministry. You know me, I'm all for sort of evangelism and church planting, yeah? Oh, we need some Bible teaching in Wales. And Wales has got this big name for Bible teaching, hasn't it? To preserve this gospel truth in its effectiveness and power. And that, it's a testimony to how much we need that, that this thought is such a surprise to quite so many Welsh 
Christian men and women. I rebuke myself for that. Let's try and make amends. <laughs>